Um, so while I was preparing this talk, I realized that the title that I submitted, Characterizing Thurston Maps by Lifting Trees, was actually not quite as accurate as the title, A Combinatorial Thurston Theory. And I thought that that also fit, fit better within the mini course on Thurston Theory. Um, but maybe to be modest, I should say that this is a special case of a combinatorial Thurston Theory. In particular, what we're interested in is advancing bridges between complex or within complex dynamics. That's the theme of the conference. But um, a, a bridge that I'd also like to emphasize is the bridge between complex dynamics and low dimensional topology and geometric group theory. So the bridge that I'm most interested in um, is, is that one. And I'll also um, maybe just give a plug, this top image. Here is an image from um, ISERM, which is having a semester in braids at the same time as MSRI. But for one week, both Dan Margalit, my collaborator, and I will be speaking about this related work at um, ISERM during MSRI just to advertise that. All right, so we're focused on Thurston's theory. I said we'll be talking about a special case. And we have this um, dichotomy of uh, William Thurston that says if we have a post-critically finite topological polynomial, then either it's equivalent to a polynomial or it has a Levy cycle. And here, by the way, what I mean by topological polynomial is a branch cover from the complex plane to itself. In the spirit of this being a mini course, I should also define what I mean by equivalence, because I, I haven't seen that elsewhere. Um, so we say that um, branch self-covers of the complex plane to itself that preserve a set of points P, those are our topological polynomials. And we say that they're equivalent if they differ by a change of coordinates of the complex plane, or more precisely, two branched covers with the same post-critical set, F and G are equivalent if I can draw this commutative diagram, that is, if they differ by, an orientation by orientation preserving homeomorphisms H1 and H2 that are isotopic rel the proper set. All right, um, so back to the idea of Thurston's theorem. Thurston's theorem gives us this dichotomy of post-critically finite um, topological polynomials as either being equivalent to a polynomial or being obstructed in this special way of having a Levy cycle. And one interesting problem is to effectivize this, this theorem. That is, to give an algorithm to determine whether or not a given topological polynomial is, in fact, equivalent to a polynomial, or whether it's um, obstructed. And in the case where it is a, equivalent to a polynomial, to determine which polynomial it's equivalent to. Um, so in the spirit of this being a combinatorial algorithm, we're going to use the characterization of a, a polynomial as the existence of a Hubbard tree. So this, it, this um, equivalence, one direction's due to Doherty and Hubbard, the other can be a, um, attributed through a different set of conditions due to Poyer, and that's what we'll focus on later. Um, but what we give is a combinatorial algorithm to decide um, whether a post-critically finite topological polynomial is a polynomial or not. And so what um, Belk, Linear, Margalit, and myself find, or do, is we find this algorithm that determines the Hubbard tree if a topological polynomial is equivalent to a polynomial, or it finds an obstruction. And the obstruction that it finds specifically is the canonical obstruction. So the strategy that we use is one motivated from geometric group theory, that we build a simplicial complex, we define a simplicial map on that complex, and then what we show is that by iterating that simplicial map, we converge to something. And that something is either a finite set, in the case of polynomials, 
or it's an infinite set with a specific structure in the case of obstructed topological polynomials. And once we've found that set to which we converge, we simply check a neighborhood within that set to find either the Hubbard tree or the canonical obstruction. So this is an overview of what we'll be doing. And by the way, this, this um, procedure might sound familiar, and that's rightly so, because we are contributing a new bridge in an already rich theory of algorithms effectivizing Thurston's theory. Um, so I, I've listed names. I won't say all of them out loud. OK. What we are really introducing here is an approach to mapping class groups that hasn't previously been applied in the context of complex dynamics. Um, so there's many ways of approaching the mapping class group, but two of them of specific interest to understanding topological polynomials are that of geometric group theory and that of combinatorial topology. So Bartoli and Nekrasiewicz use iterated monodromy groups. Um, specifically, they're viewing the mapping class group as the outer automorphisms of the fundamental group of, in this case, a punctured surface. And this is really a geometric group theoretic perspective on the mapping class group. In contrast, um, what Belk, Lanier, Margalit, and myself use is we use trees, um, specifically through the Alexander method approach to the uh, mapping class group. And so this is more of a topological approach to understanding the mapping class group. And so what I mean by Alexander method uh, for mapping classes is if I have a surface and I want to look at a homeomorphism of that surface, um, what I can do is I can look at curves. And the reason it's enough to look at curves is this Alexander method says, if I have two homeomorphisms of the surface and the image of a sufficient set of curves, namely a filling set of curves and maybe a few others, if the image of that set of curves is isotopic under these two maps, the two maps themselves are isotopic. And so we can reduce the isotopy problem of maps, of homeomorphisms, to an isotopy problem of curves. Similarly, we'll, we'll use an Alexander method for branched covers. So the version that I'll state um, is due to Belk, Lanier, Margalit, and myself, but um, it's also a special case of, or the quadratic case is also a special case of uh, Szeplatewska and Timurin which says, if I take a tree, and now instead of looking at its image, I look at its pre-image under two branched covers. If the two branched covers, or if the two pre-images are isotopic as trees, the branched covers themselves are isotopic. I also need some additional data. I need to know how the map work, maps between the pre-image. I need the actual action of edges between the pre-image and, um, and the original tree. However, the information of a tree, its pre-image, and the action of the, um, of the branched cover suffices to determine a topological polynomial. It suffices as enough information to tell you what map we're referring to. Okay, so as a summary, this Alexander method is a combinatorial topological approach to understanding mapping classes and then further branched covers when viewed as higher dimensional mapping classes. Um, so specifically what we're doing is we're viewing a topological polynomial as a tree map. This holds some themes to what Dylan was talking about on Tuesday, and we can view the equivalence class of a topological polynomial sort of in correspondence with the equivalence class of a tree image of a tree. And here I'm specifically saying equivalence class because there's two possible equivalence classes that we might be interested in. We might be interested in the isotopy class in order to say that two branch covers are isotopic, but we might also be interested in the Thurston equivalence class or the homeomorphism class. And the correspondence holds for, for both types of equivalence classes. 
Okay, so this Alexander method gives us a combinatorial topological approach to mapping class groups, which we're then translating to a combinatorial topological approach to branch covers. Okay, so back to Thurston's theorem um, that a post-critically finite topological polynomial is either equivalent to a polynomial or it has a Levy cycle. In order to understand this combinatorial topological approach to Thurston theory, we'll first focus on this case where f is equivalent to a polynomial. And as a reminder, the, the idea that we're going to use there is that our topological polynomial has a Hubbard tree. OK, so a fact is that every uh, and a fact due to Doherty and Hubbard is that every polynomial has a, a distinct Hubbard tree. And what I mean by this is the Hubbard tree suffices to distinguish the topological polynomial. For instance, the Hubbard tree for the rabbit is shown here within the Julia set. Um, and the features that will be important to us are that the Hubbard tree is invariant under a lifting operation. So what I mean by this lifting operation is I first take the preimage, and I've shown what this means both abstractly as an abstract embedding in the complex plane and also as an embedding in the Julia set. So we take the preimage, but then we forget any edges that are not part of paths between the post-critical set. I call this operation taking the hull. So the two operations here together um, of taking the preimage and then taking the hull are what I'll call the lifting map of a tree. I'd also like to point out that we need extra data that is the action of the topological polynomial on the tree because the tripod that I've shown here is both the Hubbard tree of the rabbit and of the co-rabbit. But in the case of the rabbit, the preimage lifts, rotates the edges clockwise, and in the case of the co-rabbit, the uh, pre-image rotates the edges counterclockwise. So we need additionally the data of how the topological polynomial maps the pre-image to the original, or to the tree. Okay, and by the way, many of you may be familiar with the Hubbard tree of the airplane polynomial as being a path of length two thought of in the, um, in, the, in the real axis, but what we're doing here is we're allowing for abstract embeddings in the complex plane. So I could choose three post, or I could choose three marked points in the complex plane to not fall along the real line, and the Hubbard tree for the airplane polynomial would still be a path of length two, it would just look a little bit different. And so, one of the advantages is that we're not constrained by the actual numerical data. Or I, I see that as an advantage. Um, OK, so the, the key feature here is that the Hubbard tree is invariant under the lifting map. And we'll use as the definition of the Hubbard tree um, this characterization by Poyer that says that the Hubbard tree for a polynomial is the unique tree that has an invariant angle assignment under lifting, so non-zero angle assignment under lifting. So what I mean by that is I can assign to every, ver or to every angle in my tree an in, in, in angle. Um, I can lift that, or I can take the preimage, which naturally assigns an angle to every angle of my preimage. And then when I forget, I have to combine angles. So that means that I add some of them together. And Poyer says that um, a tree is a Hubbard tree for the given topological polynomial if it has an invariant angle assignment. In this case, we see that the angles just rotate, so we have two sort of separate systems or separate um, equalities within this system of linear equations, one of which determines that the angles are pi over three around that central vertex, and one of which determines that the angles along the outer vertices are all two pi. Okay, so that's an example of a tree that does have an invariant non-zero angle assignment. Let's look at a tree that does not. So here I have a tree that's invariant under some topological polynomial, and it suffices 
to tell you the topological polynomial that I'm talking about by telling you it's pre-image. That's what the Alexander method says. So I'm telling you this topological polynomial by first finding the pre-image. I then eliminate any of the edges that are not part of the hull among the post-critical set. And when I combine the angles, I have to add their measures. And I end up with this system of linear equations. And you might, you might notice that I have these two equations that are in conflict, um, namely this equation here and this equation here cannot both hold with non-zero angle measure. So if theta 3 equals 1 half theta 5 and theta 5 equals theta 3, they must both be 0. Um, therefore, this tree does not have a non-zero angle, invariant angle assignment. Um, the other condition of Poyer is that, no that there are no periodic edges between Julia vertices. OK. And so again, what we're using here is this um, Alexander method that says that a tree, its preimage, and the action between the two suffice to determine not just a polynomial, but also a topological polynomial. This is what the Alexander method says. But when we can say more, when we can find a Hubbard tree, that Hubbard tree will then suffice to determine the equivalence class of our topological polynomial. And we need to consider trees up to equivalence, where here I just mean up to orientation-preserving homeomorphism and, and isotopy. So for instance, while these two trees are not um, isotopic, they are, in fact, homeomorphic. They're both paths of length 2. And so if, if I discover two different topological polynomials, each, each of which has one of these trees as its Hubbard tree, those two topological polynomials will themselves be equivalent. So our goal here is to find the homeomorphism class of the Hubbard tree. And so the, the natural question is, how do we do it? And this is where we appeal to geometric group theory. We build a simplicial complex. And the simplicial complex that we'll build, we call the tree complex. We fix a set P of um, marked points in the complex plane. And we'll define the tree complex, rel P, um, where the vertices correspond to isotopy classes of trees, and the simplices correspond to subforest collapses or alternatively subforest expansions. So what I mean by this is, given a set of four marked points in the complex plane, these two trees are both correspond to vertices of the simplicial complex, but um, there's this edge E here, where if I contract it in the tree on the left, it will yield the tree on the right. Therefore, these two trees are adjacent in the tree complex. Um, alternatively, we could think of adding in an edge to go from the tree from the right to the tree on the left. And that's what I mean by um, subforest expansion. OK, so for example, if we have three marked points in the complex plane, um, the a portion of the tree complex is this, well, the, the tree complex is the 3-2 uh, bipartite regular tree. And a portion of it looks like this. Here in the center, you can see the Hubbard tree for the, for the rabbit polynomial. And adjacent to it, you see these three paths of length 2, each of which you obtain by contracting one of the three edges. Um, and so a couple facts that will be useful about this tree complex. The first is that the tree complex is locally finite. So for every vertex, it corresponds to an isotopy class of trees. There's only finitely many edges that you can contract. There's also only finitely many edges that you could add without ending up outside of the hull of the um, marked set. So the tree complex is locally finite. An equally important but harder um, theorem or proposition is that the tree complex is connected, and in fact, it's simply connected. But this can be seen um, 
due to work of Hubbard and Mazur, or alternatively Penner, that this tree complex is dual to a um, triangulation of Pike Miller space. So for example, we have our tree complex here with three marked points, and the dual um, triangulation of Pike Miller space is, is as such. OK. But what we'll be now interested in doing is defining a simplicial map on this simplicial complex. And the, the simplicial map that we'll use is actually the lifting map defined for individual trees. So if we have our post-critically finite topological polynomial f, we can lift any given tree. And remember, what I mean by lifting is I take the pre-image and then I remove any edges that are not part of the hull among the marked points. That's our lifting map. And then we can extend that to the entire tree complex. It's known that there is a fixed point, namely the Hubbard tree is a fixed point of this lifting map. And our strategy will be to lift any tree until you end up at the Hubbard tree. So for example, for the airplane polynomial, we can start with any tree we want, such as this one. And our algorithm says you take the pre-image, you some of the edges of the pre-image are not part of the regulated hull among the post-critical set, and so you forget those edges. The tree that you obtain is not the same as the tree that you started with, therefore you repeat this process. So you take the pre-image, some of the edges are not part of the hull of the marked set, so we, we take that hull, we simplify, and the tree that we get some of you may recognize as the Hubbard tree for the airplane polynomial, but if we didn't know that we were using the airplane polynomial, all we know is that it's not the same as the tree that we started with. So we have to repeat this process. We take the pre-image. Some of the edges are not part of the, um, of the hull. We forget those edges, and we, in fact, obtain the same tree. Therefore, we've landed on an invariant tree. And our hope is that this process will always land on the Hubbard tree, that we found an invariant tree. That's great. But in fact, that's not true. Um, for instance, for simply the rabbit polynomial, we have cyclic permutation of the three trees that are adjacent to the Hubbard tree in the tree complex. So what I mean by this is here in the center, we have the Hubbard tree and the three vertices that are distance one from it just um, permute of cycle three. And so it's too much to hope for that there's this globally attracting fixed point. So the next best possibility would be that there's a finite nucleus. That is, that there's a finite set of vertices that under lifting, we end up in that finite set. And what we prove and what makes our algorithm work is that that's exactly what happens. So if we have an unobstructed, post-critically finite topological polynomial, this lifting map will converge to a finite set, has a finite nucleus. And this finite nucleus contains the Hubbard tree. OK, so let's look at a proof of this theorem. Um, I'll do it in two steps. The first step will be that there is a nucleus. And the second step will be that it's finite. OK, so the nucleus I propose are the periodic trees. And the existence of this nucleus comes from three basic facts. One is that the lifting map is simplicial. And how we check that the lifting map is simplicial is we need to know that vertices go to vertices. But all that says is that when you lift a tree, you get another tree. The harder condition to check is that we have to check that simplices go to simplices. But remember, what, what adjacency means in our simplicial complex is that if two trees differ by a contraction, they're adjacent. Um, and so what we need here is that contraction of a tree lifts to contraction of another tree. But we can see that this happens if we just highlight the edges we plan on contracting. Their pre-images will be edges in the pre-image and we can contract those. So contraction, in fact, lifts to contraction. 
Okay, so F star is a simplicial map. Um, and in particular, that means that it's distance non-increasing. We need that it's distance increasing, but we know that our, our simplicial map has a fixed point, and we know that, it's that our simplicial complex is locally finite. And these three facts together are enough to say that all trees eventually are in some, in, in some periodic cycle. In other words, under the lifting map, all trees are eventually or are, are pre-periodic. OK, so that, that tells us what our nucleus is. Now we're going to study our nucleus to determine that it's finite. OK, so every periodic tree, and so what we're going to show is, in fact, that every periodic tree is distance at most two from the Hubbard tree. OK, so to do this, we'll use Poyer's conditions again. Recalling that Poyer's conditions say that a, not, that a tree is a Hubbard tree if it has a non-zero invariant angle assignment and that it has no periodic uh, Julia edges, or no periodic edges between Julia vertices. And we'll use these conditions to fix any, in, any periodic or invariant tree at, to bring it closer to the Hubbard tree. And we'll show that we can do this in two steps. OK, so first of all, we know that our hull consists of periodic trees. We're going to take some power of the lifting map just to make a periodic tree invariant. Um, so that we can work with invariant trees. And what we'll then do is we'll fix the, um, we'll, we'll fix the tree so that it satisfies Poyer's conditions. We'll first fix the angle structure. And what I mean by that is if we start with this tree that does not have an invariant non-zero angle assignment um, from, from the previous example, we saw that there was this system of linear equations, and there were two equations in particular that had to be that required that um, theta three and theta five had to be zero. <clears throat> what we'll do to fix those angles is we'll just fold. So we'll take the zero angles. We'll actually make them zero. And what I mean by this is I highlight the angles. I collapse the edges. Um, until I identify them as, or I identify the first half of the edges to be equivalent edges. Um, so I, I go from this path of length three to this four pod on the right. And I'd like to highlight that this, pro that this process of um, folding the edges gave me something that was adjacent in the tree complex. Because in particular, I can contract the two blue edges in the tree on the right to obtain the tree on the left. Alternatively, if I started with the tree on the left, I could expand at the angles by adding in an edge. By the way, this is one way to go from the tree on the right to the tree on the left is through this single edge. There, if we're not careful, we could also add a tree, an intermediate tree, in between. But that's sort of irrelevant to my point, um, because my point is that these two trees are adjacent, not that there isn't a longer path. Um, OK, so this is how I fix the angle structure. I can think of fixing the angle structure as a forest expansion of the tree that I started with. I add in some edges. Next, we're going to focus on eliminating periodic Julia edges. That's a little bit easier. So if I have this invariant tree, it has um, the, the marked, the red vertices are my post-critical set. And I'm also considering them to be my Fatou set in this particular example, or my Fatou vertices in this particular example. So the vertices that aren't marked are Julia vertices. And the edge between them is what we call a Julia edge. And this tree is invariant under the same map that I was looking at previously. The map, by the way, happens to be the um, three-eared rabbit map, but that's irrelevant to understanding the example. Um, so this tree is invariant under my previous lifting map. 
However, I notice that the edges permute. So all of, in this case, all of the edges are periodic, but only one of them is a Julia edge, and that's this middle edge. And we want to eliminate all periodic Julia edges, and we simply do that by contracting them in the original tree and then contracting their pre-image in the lift. So when we do the contraction, we have now this lift of the four pod to the four pod. Um, so eliminating periodic Julia edges is just a forest contraction. And what I'm claiming here is that by starting with a periodic tree, we can move by the sequence of expanding at certain angles and then contracting at certain edges to obtain the Hubbard tree. What we do need in the process is we need that the, the second step, the contractions, don't introduce zero angles. But in Poyer's conditions, he actually only requires that you have an invariant angle, an invariant non-zero angle assignment on the Fatou vertices. And since the contractions are, at, are along Julia edges, they don't affect the angle assignment that matters. OK, so that's, that's fine. So just to summarize this proof, if we have an unobstructed uh, post-critically finite topological polynomial, it has a finite nucleus. That finite nucleus contains the Hubbard tree. The nucleus consists of periodic trees. We take a power so that each tree is inver or that a tree of interest is invariant. And that tree, we show, is distance two, that, it, that is an expansion and a contraction from the Hubbard tree. Um, <clears throat> this tells us that the nucleus is contained in a two neighborhood of the Hubbard tree. So let's look at a couple nuclei. The nucleus for the rabbit polynomial exactly consists of the Hubbard tree and these three trees that are distance one away from it that cycle periodically. Um, and earlier, we looked at an example of the airplane where we lifted and actually ended up at the Hubbard tree. And that's always what happens in the case of the airplane because the nucleus is exactly the Hubbard tree. So all trees will eventually lift to the Hubbard tree for the airplane. OK. As an application of this, um, Belk, Lanier, Margalit, and myself observed that we're making a statement that trees converge to a finite set. We can also make a statement that curves converge to a finite set. And so this answers, in the case of post-critically finite topological polynomials, a question of Pilgrim, that curves have a finite global attractor. Um, and what that means is if I start with any multi-curve and lift, it will eventually end up in some finite set of multi-curves. And the proof is as follows. I start with any, any multi-curve. I find a tree such that that multi-curve um, surrounds a neighborhood of a subforest of the tree. I know from our, from our theorem that if I lift that tree enough, I'll end up in some finite set of trees. But the curve will have to surround um, subforests of those finite set of, of that finite of trees in that finite set. And those are all finite trees. So the possible subforest is also finite, and, or is it also a finite set? And therefore, I end up in some finite set of multi-curves. OK. So I've been focusing on the, obstruct, uh, on the unobstructed case. Maybe now is a good time to see if there are questions before I move on to the obstructed case. So you used you used Thurston's theorem yes. to prove your the, to yes. prove your, the existence of your fixed point. You didn't reprove it. Uh, the, the claim that there was a, an invariant nucleus depended on the statement that there actually was a fixed point. Yes, and in particular, Poirier's conditions require Thurston's theorem. Okay. I have one more uh, one question. Um, do you know if in unobstructed case, uh, maybe after iteration, uh, this map you're considering is homotopic to a strictly contracting map? 
metrically? I, I do not know that falls within. So we, we don't understand this lifting map w very well yet. Um, and so that's maybe a next direction for, for us or for other people. Thanks. OK. So let's, let's move on to the obstructed case. So in the spirit of this being a mini course, I'll remind us what Levy cycles are. So if we have a post-critically finite topological polynomial, a Levy cycle is a multi-curve with the property that the components of the multi-curve cyclically permute with degree one. And they map to each other with degree one. And a theorem due to Thurston, Burstein, Levy, Shishikura, Tan, and the only place that I've seen it written in generality is in Hubbard's book, is that, a, is that my post-critically finite topological polynomial is equivalent to a polynomial if and only if it does not have a Levy cycle. Um, the proof of this goes through Thurston's theorem um, and uses the pullback map on Teichmuller space. I just wanted to advertise this, though it's not at all used in what we're doing. Um, it, does, it does somewhat mimic what we are, are, are lifting map. Um, and, and I think that this is, um, again, an, an interesting question to consider in the future. OK, so what we will focus on are not just Levy cycles, but on canonical obstructions, first defined by Pilgrim, um, where Pilgrim says that an obstructed topological polynomial has what's called a canonical obstruction. He defines it as the curves that converge to having length 0 under this lifting process. But Selinger reformulates it um, as the canonical obstruction is the minimal multi-curve with the property that the exterior of that multi-curve is, um, is a, actually a polynomial, or the first return map on the exterior is actually a polynomial. OK, so with this in mind, we're going to generalize the notion of trees to that of bubble trees. And we'll use bubble trees to help us find um, the, um, the canonical obstruction. OK, so a bubble tree is a generalization of a tree in that now we allow vertices, um, line, line segments, or curve edges, and then also simple closed curves that surround two or more marked points. And like with trees, we can lift them by taking their preimages, and or we can take their preimage, and then we can also take a hull. We're taking a hull means we remove any edges or curves that are not part of um, paths between marked points or essential bubbles, where an essential bubble is one that contains two or bounds a disk containing two or more marked points. Um, and the bubble trees will be in the boundary of our tree complex. So here I've drawn it in tight Mueller space. Um, because I think it's a little bit easier to see. But an example of a bubble tree lies along this, um, lies along this boundary. OK. And a proposition of belk Lanier, Marguerite, and myself is that every unobstructed topological polynomial has a Hubbard bubble tree. Thank you. Every obstructed topological polynomial has a Hubbard bubble tree. It's also true that every unobstructed topological polynomial has a Hubbard bubble tree. It's just the Hubbard tree um, with trivial bubbles. So, so my other statement was also correct. Uh, thank you. <laughs> um, and, and again, these, these bubble trees lie in the boundary of Heitmuller space. Um, but the theorem that is actually central to our, the obstructed side of our algorithm is that a similar process to what we used um, to sort of find the Hubbard tree within a nucleus works for obstructed polynomials. Um, but, in, but, because we're con but, we, but because we're looking for something on the boundary, a neighborhood of the Hubbard bubble tree is an infinite set. So if we lift, we'll eventually end up in a two neighborhood of the Hubbard bubble tree, 
except in this case, that two neighborhood is an infinite set. So for instance, um, we, this is um, what, what a twisting of z squared plus i looks like um, when we lift it, we sort of swap between these two paths of, or there is a path in um, the tree complex, and we sort of skip adjacent vertices in this lifting process. OK, but our two theorems together that within a two neighborhood of any invariant tree is a either Hubbard tree or Hubbard bubble tree gives us an algorithm to effectivize Thurston's theorem, which says you start with any tree, you apply the lifting map. At any stage, check a two neighborhood of that lifting map, either for a tree that satisfies Poyer's, a tree that satisfies Poyer's conditions or for a tree that shows you a canonical obstruction. And by shows you, I mean has bubbles that are the canonical obstruction. If you don't find a Hubbard tree or a canonical obstruction, just repeat the process with your previous tree. OK, actually, let's go back before I move on to an, another application. Yeah. But uh, you said that the two neighborhood is an infinite set, mm -hmm. so but you, so you check everything in an infinite set for Poirier conditions and canonical obstructions, is it right? Um, no, so you're checking for the tree at the lifting stage that you're at, and because mm -hmm. your tree complex is locally finite, anything you get from lifting a tree will be another tree in your tree complex. And so the two neighborhood of any tree along the process is a finite set. So at any stage, you only have to check a finite okay. set. Thank you. Thanks. OK. So I will now discuss an application of this theorem to the twisted rabbit problem. Um, many, many of you in the room are experts. But for those of you who aren't, I'll just give a brief overview um, that we start with the rabbit polynomial. It has a post-critical point that is three periodic. We mark that set within the complex plane and draw a, um, a curve surrounding the ears of the rabbit. We then post-compose the rabbit polynomial with a Dane twist around that, um, that curve. And due to Burstein and Levy, we know that this post-composition of the rabbit polynomial will be equivalent to a polynomial. The three options are the rabbit, the co-rabbit, and the airplane. And we want to know which one. And um, Hubbard made this into a, a broader problem, where instead of looking at just a twisting by one power of the Dane twist, he asked, can we give a function where we raise the Dane twist to a power k, and the output is the polynomial that the resulting map is equivalent to. And Bartoli and Nekrashevich originally solved this problem in 2006. And this, this was huge, because the problem had been open for 25 years. Um, what, what we do is we give a different solution using our techniques that allow us to answer similar twisting questions for higher numbers of post-critical points and even higher degree polynomials. Um, and so I'll, I'll demonstrate how that works. We start with our twisted rabbit. And we guess what the Hubbard tree might be. We'll then perform a lifting map. And in this case, because the, the post-critically finite or topological polynomial is a composition of the rabbit polynomial and a Dane twist, we'll undo those in the opposite order. So with our guess, we'll first untwist. Then we'll lift or pull back to get a different tree. And because this tree is different, it is not the Hubbard. Neither one is the Hubbard, or the first one is not the Hubbard tree for this topological polynomial. Um, so we perform the lifting algorithm with this resulting tree. We untwist, then we pull back, and the resulting tree is 
the same or at least isotopic to the original. Therefore, the, this path of length two is the Hubbard tree for the topological polynomial, which tells me that in fact this twisted, um, this twisted map is equivalent to the airplane polynomial. Okay, and so the, the solution to the original twisted rabbit problem as given by Bartoli and Nekrashevich is that it's a four attic solution. Um, but we chose to look at the twisted, more eared rabbit problem, which is still four attic, but only barely. Um, and, and it works as follows. If I twist the, in this case, three eared rabbit by the Dane twist gamma, um, powers of the Dane twist gamma, the polynomial, topological polynomial that it's equivalent to depends only on the congruence class of the power mod four. Unless it's a power of four, then you divide by all powers of four until you obtain one, two, or three mod four. And so the resulting topological polynomial is either equivalent to an Airbus, a Cocopelli, or a Basilica tuned with Basilica. But it turns out this answer is true for a, a twisted rabbit with any number of ears. Um, so here I've shown where you need to add the ears in and where additional post-critical points would be added in in the solution maps. But you can twist an n-eared rabbit, and this, um, the solution to the twisted rabbit problem will depend only on the power of k mod 4. And it will be the, a generalization of an Airbus, a generalization of a Cocopelli, or a generalization of a Basilica tuned with Basilica. Oh, I, I think so. And I think that's true. I, exactly, I think that's true. And the reason is, is because there's more relations in the mapping class group of a punctured sphere that has more than four punctures. Um, let's repeat the question. Oh, okay. yes, okay, so, so with, thank with you. Device. So Dirk's question was, is the original, so, so what we're showing is that the higher, uh, higher mark point cases are harder than the original, or are easier than the original that, that Bartoli and Nekrashevich only did, did the only hard case, and I, I said yes, I think, I think they did the only hard case. Um, <laughs> Uh, yes, I think it's, it's really very close, in fact, because if for k equals zero, mod four, then you have to do recursively yes. the same thing, exactly as for the classical rabbit. Yes. Now, it so happens that if you just have three points, then there aren't three cases, Airbus, Cocopelli, and Basilica. There are just two other cases, so it gets folded a little bit, so the k is mm -hmm. three mod four is also something you have to do recursion on. But really, yes. it's, it's the same kind of, of yes. Yes. argument anyways. Uh, now, the way we answered the question is that we considered t to the 4k composed with p, and we showed that it's really the same thing as p composed with t to the k. Yes, and we used a similar method. So probably you also, yes, yes. you can see Absolutely. by these graph, yes. graph lifting yes. exactly. that you can get rid of... Uh, of a multiple of four by doing it in the other direction. Yes, exactly. Um, the difference, or one thing that we were able to make easier in the higher post-critical case is we were able to choose our um, post-set representative differently for different situations, where when there's only three uh, where there's only two cosets, there's, there's not a lot of choice of coset representatives or not a lot of need for choice for coset representatives, but we use different coset representatives for the different cases um, or different stages of lifting even. Um, yes, thank you. It, yes, it's very similar. Um, okay, I guess I needed to include my joke. You get an Airbus, a Cocopelli, or here I've shown only a Basilica. We actually need a basilica tuned with a basilica. Um, and maybe I'll just advertise that our, our method 
can also be used for preperiodic polynomials. Bartoli and Nekrashevich also did this. Um, looking at a twisted z squared plus i, our methods similarly work for such a, for, for similar cases. Um, so the solution to the twisted z squared plus i was given by Bartoli and Nekrashevich. But like with rabbits, we can also generalize to higher numbers of post-critical points um, that are still preperiodic. And it turns out that in that case, we actually get a periodic solution to the um, twisted generalized z squared plus i polynomial question um, when there's four or more post-critical points. Um, also, Justin Lanier and I have been working on some additional um, twisted twisting problems. So a couple years ago, this was more impressive two years ago when I gave this talk, but a couple years ago, Hubbard visited Michigan and asked um, what happens when you twist a cocopelli. And at some point we thought it was definitely, it definitely had a 16 addict solution, but there's two cases where we're really having trouble to um, finishing, and that's why this is not out yet. But we think it's, well, we know it's at least a 16 addict solution, and there's two cases that might be even more. Um, Justin and I have also solved a twisted cubic rabbit problem um, where there the solution is 9 addict. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Any questions from the online audience? I have a few questions. Um, I, uh, I, I suppose um, you, know, you, you have an algorithm. So uh, I, I start with this. So uh, you have an algorithm. So um, may, maybe, maybe there's no hope for this. But do you have any, any, any um, estimate on the uh, time that it would take it to converge um, and how one might be able to bound this? And um, is this something? Um, how easy is it to implement and have you implemented it and how does it work in practice? Ah, okay, so there's two questions here that I'll, I'll address separately. We have not considered the, um, the speed of the algorithm in part because we think that this is a great undergraduate project and we're just waiting for the right set of undergraduates to approach it. Um, and for effectivizing the algorithm, actually Will Warden and with some help from Mark Bell are working on um, programming it. So, Thank you. So suppose that you have a rational function where, which is post-critically post finite, but uh, some, so, so, there are some genuinely pre-periodic points. Mm -hmm. You can act on this by the mapping class group of the complement of the post-critical set. Do you have any idea of what the structure in that mapping class group of the set of obstructed or the set leading to any particular polynomial might be? I, I really am trying to get it, not just powers of Dane twists, mm -hmm. but a, a subset of the, of the mapping class group. No, we also have not thought about it. Um, that's, that's a great direction to think about. Um, one thing I'd be interested in that I think our algorithm might give us some power to consider is what, what your, what's at, I think, the core of your question, which is what sorts of mapping classes might you apply mm -hmm. to obtain an obstructed map? Um, and, and therefore, coming up with some sort of condition on what it takes to obstruct a map, or what sorts of twists can cause a map to become obstructed. I think that that's a really interesting question, and we haven't, we haven't thought about it much. Thank you. Uh, I have two questions, well, one question or one answer. <laughs> so first, for what uh, Hamel just asked, mm -hmm. so there is such a thing called the EDT0L languages. And that's really saying that you iterate some substitution. 
Well, you have a finite collection of substitutions that you iterate on finite initial data, and then you do some projection. So that's the general structure. If you take a, an invariant cyclic subgroup, such as the twist of the ES, you're iterating some number of times multiplied by 4, or multiplied by 4 plus 3, and then you're projecting to get a rabbit, co-rabbit, or airplane. So I don't think you'll be able to see more than that, but that's still a reasonably small class. And you can do it for the whole mapping class group. You also encode it by generators, for example, and substitutions. And this substitution is exactly the inverse of the, uh, uh, well, it's the expanding map on moduli space, or the expanding correspondence on moduli space. Now I had a question for Becker, which is, why do you do this with trees and not general graphs, so as to address rational maps? Uh, well, it seems you can also lift graphs um, and project and, and do an iteration entirely symbolically in this way. Well, certainly <coughs> one of the limitations is that the Hubbard tree is already known. It's already known how the correspond or how the dictionary between Hubbard trees and branch covers work. Um, but with rational maps, um, there's a number of difficulties that we've found in different cases. Um, I need a moment to remember what these difficulties are. Um, well, uh, yep. I, okay. the, well, first of all, you don't have this reduction. Like you can lift the graph and then what? For trees, you lift and then you can uh, like cut off all the extra stuff. In general, you won't be able to do it for graphs. Yeah. So, uh, can you hear me? Uh, yes. Uh, I, I, I thank you for the for the great talk. I, I mean, I have kind of a related question to what Laster was asking. I mean, so um, so you you pull back the trees, and so I guess we learned from Laurent, I guess in his mini course last week, that um, that the biset is sort of um, well, let's say I don't know an algebraic way of encoding, well, pulling back um, curves. So can you? Um, encode uh, pulling back the edges that you use to to you know pull back your trees in a sort of I mean can you use a biset to encode that or um, to to you know make make an algorithm that you can let's say implement in the computer? Um, I don't think we had considered using bisets to encode the edges. Or maybe something else. I mean, some you know let's say algebraic or what. Uh, um, I, I, I'm not sure. Oh, okay, okay, yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I, I have another question. Um, so, so when you have a Hubbard tree, in, in a way, the thing, the information that you really need is the tree on the singular set on the critical values. Um, so the critical points that are kind of not in, the, in that tree already, they're kind of really only included to tell you which Hovitz class you're in. And if you know, I think which Hovitz class you're in, or if you have your covering, then you can always re reconstruct the pre-image of that one. So I was wondering, um, in your algorithm, if you only did iteration on trees that included the critical values, but not necessarily all of the critical points, um, would that still work? Um. Is that enough? Uh, so, the, do you mean contain the critical values and all post-critical points, or? Uh, yeah, yes, yes. All, uh, sorry, all post-critical points. So the whole, the whole orbits, forward okay. orbits of the of the of the uh, critical values in themselves, but not necessarily the critical points that sit sort of away somewhere. Yeah, um, we we do not require that our trees contain the critical points if they're pre-periodic. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay, we are running out of time, so uh, we'll ask we'll ask questions after uh, during breaks. Uh, so let's thank the speaker again. <laughs>